uh, good morning all, and uh, thank you all for being here on this really exciting day. Uh, for my capstone uh, project, I did a literature review, which made comparisons to what was written in the Chinese classical record uh, in, uh, on cannabis and compared it uh, to contemporary research to evaluate the usefulness of cannabis in today's clinical setting. So my name is Mark Velez, and I present to you rectifying the Chinese classical record on cannabis. Before we begin, though, uh, I would just like to express my sincere gratitude uh, to the Capstone Committee, uh, especially Dr. Robin Sauters, who has talked me down from many a ledge, um, and uh, Dr. Mark Sauters and Dr. Rick Grieve. Thank you all very much. I'd also like to thank the uh, staff and faculty of Five Branches University, especially the founders, uh, Joanna Zhao and uh, Ron Zeidman. Thank you so much for helping to create this wellspring of uh, Chinese medicine uh, knowledge, making it accessible to students in the West like myself. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, um, my family, actually not last, let me just throw in Lonnie Jarrett, uh, Brant Stickley, and Elizabeth Rochat de la Vallee. Uh, they all had uh, meaningful contributions in this process from uh, start to finish, uh, so thank you. And then last, but certainly not least, my, my family, especially my mom, Rebecca Velez, my beloved wife, Rachel Knight, and my son, Jasper Sage, thank you so much for standing by me uh, during all the sleepless nights and stressful moments. So the inspiration uh, for this project began uh, some years ago while in private practice. Uh, one of my patients who was totally naive to mind-altering substances uh, suffered a rather severe depression and uh, several injuries after starting on a cancer protocol that used a very potent cannabis concentrate that was called Rick Simpson oil. And at the end of treatment, his prostate-specific antigen levels have returned to normal levels, suggesting a remission of that cancer, um, but his quality of life was severely impacted for years after that. So his case and others like it that I've encountered over the years of practice have inspired me to dig more deeply into the nuances of this medicine known as cannabis um, in the hopes of preventing such situations from happening again. So cannabis is a plant that has a long history of use uh, for its psychoactive and potentially therapeutic properties. And with the recent easing of legal restrictions on cannabis, its use and applications are becoming increasingly widespread. According to the CDC in 2019, over 48 million people uh, had used cannabis and the market for CBD products in 2021 was estimated to be $12.8 billion. And clinicians are now being increasingly asked about recreational or therapeutic cannabis use by their patients. And <clears throat> excuse me, my personal experience has been that patients may be more comfortable uh, asking questions or discussing cannabis use with their alternative medicine practitioner than with their primary care doctor. Either way, clinicians should be able to assess potential cannabis-related imbalances or factor in cannabis use as a potential comorbidity to a presenting condition. And I believe that acupuncturists uh, can very much benefit from having more available resources to be able to offer an evidence-based opinion on cannabis use, um, empowering them to educate patients on both the harms and the benefits. So right now there's very little formal cannabis education that's being offered to acupuncturists and limited continuing education on the matter as well. Um, the current curriculum in the United States for acupuncture uh, includes hemp seed, of course, as being an excellent laxative that's suitable for use in uh, deficient patients, but very little else is said about other uses of the plant. Now, in China, uh, there is historical documentation that suggests that cannabis was used since ancient times in religious rituals to enhance the experience uh, by inhaling its smoke. Uh, moreover, the therapeutic uh, potential of cannabis was richly detailed uh, in some of the major materia medica of Chinese medicine. And this was the information that I was most interested in examining as it suggests great usefulness uh, of this medicinal. Uh, however, today's cannabis is unarguably different from the cannabis of ancient times. It's been selectively bred over the millennia uh, to yield astonishingly high concentrations of psychoactive compounds. And the way that it's being used today is very different in many ways as well. So because of this, 
some Chinese medicine scholars question the clinical usefulness uh, of cannabis as indicated in the classics, and they feel the potential for harm far outweighs the possible benefits. Others, however, see the classical record as evidence of cannabis being a veritable panacea uh, with little concern for its potential for harm. And with recent changes in the uh, legal landscape of cannabis, research on its use and potential drug applications is exploding exponentially. Um, for example, uh, between 1991 and 1995, a mere 37 peer-reviewed articles were indexed on the PubMed database uh, for the search term cannabinoids and disease. And 10 years later, that number had grown to 497, <clears throat> but by 2021, there were 2,924 results that had been returned. And a casual search just last week returned 4,809 published articles for the same search term. Uh, so many of these articles highlight incredible potential therapeutic uses, but others show that there are measurable risks that are associated with cannabis use as well. And after examining the studies more closely, uh, what emerged was that the benefits are usually associated with measured use in a clinical application. Uh, and this stands in contrast to potential deleterious effects that are usually associated with heavy recreational use or mega dose clinical use. <clears throat> So all this taken into consideration, uh, some questions started to emerge. Are the Chinese classical views on cannabis still relevant in today's clinical setting? Can they inform our practices in contemporary times? And does uh, contemporary research uh, support any of the claims that are made in the classical literature? Well, I found that there is indeed considerable relevance, especially given the current trends of therapeutic and recreational use. And so what follows is a discussion focusing on the classical Chinese literature on cannabis uh, and a brief examination of our current understanding of how cannabis affects the body. And from this, we should be able to glean a, a deeper understanding and a, and a wider perspective on this venerable herb. <clears throat> So I began this project uh, by examining three of the major Materia Medica uh, published in early China that have entries for cannabis. The Shenong Bensao Jing and the Bensao Gangmu are available in English translations. And while there are many translations available, uh, I chose a translation of the Shenong Bensao Jing uh, by Sabine Wilms uh, because she is highly respected in the Western Chinese medicine community for her high quality and thoroughly researched translations of classical Chinese medicine. Um, she's published over a dozen books on Chinese medicine, so her translations are very much tempered by a deep understanding of the nuances of, of uh, this medicine. I also chose a translation of the Ben Sao Gangmu uh, that was recently published by Paul Unschuld in 2022, and this is a particularly useful translation because it includes not only the original text in Hansa, uh, but also extensive notes and commentary by the author, who is also considered to be a highly regarded uh, Chinese medicine scholar and historian. <clears throat> An English translation of the Bensao Jingjizhu uh, was not readily available, unfortunately. I was, however, able to find uh, the original Hansa text online, and I translated it myself, uh, starting with Google Translate to generate pinyin for easier identification of the individual characters, which I then used several dictionaries to hand translate uh, the rest of that entry in the text. Um, luckily, uh, many of the entries are almost verbatim uh, from the Ben Sao Jing, and so my rough translations were compared to Sabine Wilms' translations to make sure they were fairly accurate. Um, and the secondary and tertiary sources for this area of study were chosen from textbooks that, and dictionaries that are considered to be the standard for Chinese medicine education in the United States. Now, for my literature review of contemporary research, uh, the PubMed search engine hosted by the National Library of Medicine was used almost exclusively, as it is generally recognized as a reliable database that indexes peer-reviewed journals. Um, the other sources included uh, books that are published by recognized experts on the subject matter, as well as industry websites.
the current literature based on cannabis is really wide ranging uh, with diverse subjects, including medical applications, psychological and cognitive impacts and social and economic issues. On PubMed, I use mesh, uh, mesh terms uh, such as cannabis, uh, cannabinoids, cannabidiol, the marijuana abuse and endocannabinoid uh, to capture the bulk of the literature. And then uh, from those results, I use the subheadings such as physiology, toxicity, adverse effects, and pharmacokinetics. Uh, results returned from the mesh term cannabis alone uh, totaled over 14,000. Uh, so I had to use a lot of those subheadings uh, and ultimately yielded about 1,180 uh, relevant results that I screen. And uh, results that focused on genetic expression and chemical synthesis, extraction, uh, and reports of incidental toxicity in animals were largely excluded from those studies. And from that, there was about 688 results that were actually sought for retrieval, uh, which ultimately yielded a total of 331 reports uh, that I assessed for eligibility, which uh, focused on full text ability and uh, showing uh, pertinent data to the discussion at hand. And some of these articles actually still did not have information that was within the scope of the present investigation and were subsequently excluded as well, uh, leaving a total of 210 studies, reports, and books uh, being included in this finished project. So in the ancient world, cannabis served as uh, food, medicine, and textile. It also served as a religious sacrament to alter the consciousness and promote uh, mystical experience. The, the exact origins of cannabis and its relationship with humankind are not definitively known, uh, but archeological evidence suggests that it has been used since prehistoric times. Clay tablets actually uh, made by the ancient Sumerians made reference to a plant called uh, ganzagunu, uh, the drug that takes away the mind, and guguru, uh, the drug that takes away the pain, but also robs the user of his soul. So it seems the ancients were already aware of sort of a double-edged sword of cannabis use. Uh, cannabis may also have been the substance known as soma, the nectar of the gods, uh, which is repeatedly mentioned in the ancient Hindu sacred text, the Rig Veda, uh, which dates back to about 1500 BC. And uh, the ancient Greeks may have been actually the first ones to call it cannabis. And the Greek historian Herodotus wrote about how the uh, Scythians would purify themselves after a funeral in a ritual tent where hemp seeds were heated with hot stones and the participants would howl with delight during the ritual. You can come to your own conclusions about what might've been going on in there. Now in ancient China, uh, there have been archeological findings that suggest that hemp cord or woven fabric were used to make impressions on pottery uh, that dates back to the Neolithic era. Uh, this suggests again that uh, hemp was known for its usefulness since prehistoric times. And in the late 1980s, uh, some ethnic Chinese farmers that were cultivating their fields near the Gobi Desert uh, discovered a vast burial site that was uh, later excavated in the 2000s. And archaeologists uh, subsequently di uh, dated the site to about 700 BCE. And one grave site in particular had a rather large cache of dried plant material, about two pounds, uh, which was eventually determined to be cannabis. And what's particularly interesting here is that careful analysis that was performed by Ethan Russo and Associates, he's a very uh, prominent and prolific uh, writer and a, um, a neurologist who studies cannabis. Um, his team discovered very high levels of the degraded compounds of THC, which of course is the psychoactive molecule in cannabis. And so his findings basically suggest that the plant material found was used for its intoxicating purposes instead of for food or for fiber. And around the same time uh, in the later Zhou dynasty, uh, we start to see the first mentions of an archaic character, Ma, uh, which means hemp. So cannabis was likely used as part of an elixir for alchemical or medicinal use by religious Taoists of Han Dynasty China. Uh, cannabis was also likely an ingredient that was used uh, in incense that was burned in the elaborate Boshan Lu incense sensor, which is pictured here, uh, that was used in Taoist rituals. <clears throat> and uh, 
purportedly uh, the Maoshan sect uh, Taoist scriptures were transmitted to the founding member during a cannabis induced trance. Thank you. And also there was the cult of uh, Ma Gu, the hemp maiden uh, that was popular in the Tang dynasty. So the earliest written mention of cannabis appears in the first materia medica, the Shenong Ben Sao Jing, uh, which was believed to have been compiled by several authors around the second century. And here, uh, cannabis is called Ma Fen, and an alternative name of Ma Bo is also mentioned. Uh, later authors would differentiate mafan from madza, which is hemp seed, um, sort of suggesting that mafan is the female flowering parts of the cannabis plant. <clears throat> now, what's distinct about the character ma is that its construction uh, uses a modified character for grass uh, that's combined with the radical for divide. And then uh, this leads to a character called Pi, uh, which is generally understood to mean hemp. And uh, this radical was eventually placed inside another radical uh, for a scythe or a sickle, which eventually uh, turned into uh, the radical for a shed. So taking all this together, this seems to uh, refer to the divided fibers of a plant that's drying in a shed or that was harvested with a sickle. Now, there are three basic definitions that can be inferred from the character ma. And the first and uh, most widely used refers to agricultural hemp. Uh, this character also appears in the word for uh, flax, which is yama, and for sesame, huma. And uh, ma can also refer to a state of altered consciousness, uh, like as in a daze or a stupor. Um, and another definition is numbness and tingling, kind of like when your uh, foot falls asleep. And uh, fun and bo, so ma fun and ma bo, so fun and bo both imply a vigorous display or a lush inflorescence. So ma bo and ma fun then imply an exuberant rising spike of the cannabis plant, as you may see here in this photograph. Uh, this is a feature that is very characteristic of the, the female cannabis plant, uh, which has less usable fiber for textile, uh, but significantly greater concentrations of the resin glands that secrete the psychoactive substances. This is the same part of the plant that's used in modern times for drug use. So in the Ben Sao Jing, uh, ma fun is considered to be a food crop with a spicy flavor, a uh, neutral temperature, and a toxic nature. And depending on the translation source, I found that uh, ma fun is found in the upper medicinal category, which means that it can be consumed for a long time without causing great harm to the body. Now, the Ben Sao Jing goes on to say that ma fun uh, treats the five taxations and seven damages, disinhibits the five tsang organs, moves the blood down, and treats cold qi. So here we see uh, sort of the first indications that cannabis was being used to treat physical maladies uh, that stem from excessive use of the body uh, in various ways um, and promoting organ function and uh, treating blood stagnation and internal cold. And later in the passage, we see some reference to uh, some potential psychological functions as it says that uh, eaten in large quantities, it causes one to see ghosts and run around maniacally. Uh, consumed over a long time, however, it facilitates the breakthrough of spirit illumination and lightens the body. So this part of the passage appears to highlight a potential benefit from taking cannabis while also cautioning against excessive use. And of note, the breakthrough of spirit illumination, Tong Shen Ming, uh, suggests the opening of a connection to the higher self and a spiritual intelligence that allows for the smooth unfolding of life's destiny. The passage concludes with a statement indicating some nutritive qualities that promote the digestion, uh, improves vitality, and, and slows aging. And unfortunately, the Ben Sao Jing does not offer much on how we should uh, take ma fun to optimize its effects. It only suggests that uh, there's an appropriate dosage and overuse can lead to undesirable effects. Now, the Bensao Jingjiju was uh, compiled in the late 5th century uh, by the Taoist scholar uh, Tao Hong Jing. 
And uh, the entry for Mafan, again, is nearly identical to that in the Bensao Jing, uh, but with some additional information. Uh, for example, the additional functions of breaking hard accumulations like constipation, for example, uh, stopping pain and dispelling pus are included in this text. Thank you. It also goes on to differentiate male and female uses of the plant, which uh, further suggests that the more psychoactive effects of the plant uh, were key to its uh, medicinal qualities. There's a simple recipe that's mentioned in this text that combines uh, mabo with ginseng uh, to enable one to see into the future. This text also uh, introduces the first mention of the use of the roots of cannabis uh, to treat painful conditions. Of note, uh, Ethan Russo uh, mentioned previously, uh, published a paper confirming some of these benefits of uh, the roots for painful conditions. Now the Pensal Gangmu uh, represents a major update to the Materia Medica. Uh, this was compiled by Li Shurgen and published posthumously in 1596. Now this text is unique in, in that it uh, includes extensive commentary and, and a lot of scrutiny of the earlier references to cannabis. So it's a very rich uh, body of knowledge and uh, it offers the most detailed accounts of the many therapeutic applications of, of cannabis. Now, what's most noteworthy about cannabis in the Pensal Gangmu is that nearly every part of the plant is uh, accounted for medicinally, from flower to root. Uh, cannabis here appears uh, generally as dama, which means great hemp, and then it's uh, further differentiated into mafan, uh, and then the seed matzu, uh, huangma, the skin, and uh, magen, the root. So in this particular text, one of the overarching indications is for pain, uh, especially from blood stasis and wind. And wind here is, is interesting because it actually refers to several different symptoms, including rheumatic pain, uh, rashes, and seizures. And again, mention is made several times what would appear to be psychoactive effects. Uh, for example, uh, Leisha Jen uh, mentions mixing uh, muffin with acorus root and umbrella leaf to enable one to perceive the supernatural. Now, the psychoactive and therapeutic functions of cannabis are attributed to the presence of molecules that mimic those that are created by our own bodies. The molecular structures of the phytocannabinoids, THC and CBD, uh, were first elucidated by Raphael uh, Meshulam in the 1960s, early 1960s. And uh, his discoveries would lay the foundation for later discovery of the human endocannabinoid system, uh, which is an intricate and complex chemical messaging system that appears to be responsible for many homeostatic mechanisms in the body. And the presence of canna cannabinoid receptors found throughout the nervous system and organs imply that there must be a molecule that is produced by the body. Well, indeed, as it turned out, there are two molecules uh, that are derived from a substance called arachidonic acid that were identified uh, and they called them anonymide and 2-AG, and these are the two primary endocannabinoids. And so THC and CBD basically mimic these endogenous uh, molecules. So here we have some uh, visual examples of the two primary endocannabinoids. So on the left, we have arachidonyl ethanolamide, uh, also known as anandamide. Ananda is Sanskrit for bliss, and uh, 2-AG, or the longer name, 2-arachidonyl glycerol. Um, on the right side, we see some of the major phytocannabinoids, delta-9 delta tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, which is THC. Uh, and then we have cannabidiol, which is known as CBD. Uh, and cannabinol, CBN. So uh, as a side note, uh, the psychoactive THC molecule only exists in really small quantities in uh, unprocessed cannabis. Rather, it's converted uh, from an inactive precursor to THC in the presence of heat in a process that's known as de decarboxylation. And this bears significance ultimately, depending on the route of administration, which can affect the end products. Uh, you know, for example, if it's metabolized by the liver through the digestive system as compared to pulmonary absorption. 
Now the endocannabinoid system uh, is being suggested as a sort of a master key uh, that regulates pain perception, inflammation, and many other systems that maintain homeostasis in the body. Uh, the ECS usually acts as a negative feedback loop to uh, reduce or terminate neurotransmission or to turn off an inflammatory cascade, for example. And it's thought that supplementation with cannabinoids such as CBD may help to upregulate the expression of the cannabinoid receptors and uh, ultimately normalize the function of the ECS. Of interest to our acupuncture colleagues, uh, acupuncture is suspected to interact with the endocannabinoid system as well uh, through a particular type of receptor that's known as the transient receptor potential vanilloid type, the TRPV. Uh, receptor, which was recently discovered to be also a part of uh, the endocannabinoid system. Now, CBD has been shown to greatly benefit uh, seizure disorders that are not responsive to medication. Uh, it also has been shown to benefit anxiety and chronic pain syndromes. And so here we can kind of see some of the classical indications coming out for wind, for example, and pain uh, that are now being represented in the contemporary literature. And the effects of the endocannabinoid system dysregulation uh, have led researchers to propose an endocannabinoid deficiency, uh, which may be behind some of the chronic psychiatric and inflammatory uh, and treatment resistant syndromes that we see in the clinic. And most of the phytocannabinoids also have neuroprotective actions, which may prove very useful in treating diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Many of the Chinese medicine indications do remain largely unexplored, but we can see that cannabis clearly has uh, great potential for its therapeutic applications. Now, what's particular congruent with the classical literature uh, is that smoking cannabis is never mentioned. Um, and this bears relevance to the traditional routes of preparation and administration, as uh, those methods would likely yield higher levels of the therapeutic cannabinoids and less of the psychotropic effects uh, due to the absence of heat and therefore decarboxylation. And of note, uh, a full spectrum extract is better tolerated than a purified or synthetic isolate. And this is attributed to something called the entourage effect, uh, where the other minor, uh, minor cannabinoids and terpenes and other molecules seem to synergize with CBD and THC to yield a better effect at a lower dose. Now, beside the obvious cardiopulmonary risks of smoking cannabis, there are a few other risks to consider. Uh, like any other botanical medicine, cannabis may not be the most appropriate intervention for a patient, and individual differences must be taken into consideration. Uh, for example, there is the cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, which is increasingly being reported in emergency rooms across the United States. And uh, this is a condition where intractable vomiting occurs after the consumption of cannabis. And, uh, while there's some evidence that suggests it could be genetic, there is other evidence that suggests that it could be a cumulative effect. Uh, the mechanism is actually poorly understood still. There's also some correlations between cannabis use and lack of motivation, but bidirectional influences kind of muddy up these results. Um, cannabis use disorder, however, is uh, well documented and accepted in the DSM-5, which is the diagnostic standard for psychiatric conditions used in the United States. And lastly, um, CBD is metabolized by the liver and is contraindicated in patients taking drugs uh, that use the uh, cytochrome uh, P450 pathway. Uh, so if your medication says do not take grapefruit juice, CBD is contraindicated. Uh, there's a few limitations to my capstone project. Um, and basically it's the uh, interpretation of medieval Chinese into English is, is challenging at best. And you need to really look at the individual characters. So. And the scientific literature is also vast and uh, not every article is able to be reviewed. And uh, there's little research on the therapeutic benefits of the mind altering functions of cannabis. So I'd like to see more research uh, that specifically evaluates the claims that are made in, in Chinese medicine um, and how we can treat them because there may be disharmonies that arise. So in conclusion, uh, cannabis has been used for thousands of years in many different cultures for both medicinal and religious purposes. Uh, the chemical compounds in cannabis, particularly THC and CBD, have therapeutic benefits for a variety of conditions, uh, including chronic pain, anxiety, and epilepsy. 
uh, the endocannabinoid system also plays a crucial role in regulating many of the physiological processes and cannabis interacts with the system to produce its effects. Cannabis can have potential risks and side effects, uh, particularly when used in high doses or over long periods of time. Now, Chinese medicine has a unique perspective on cannabis and its therapeutic uses, and I feel that this perspective can provide valuable insights for modern medicine. But more research is really needed to fully understand the therapeutic potential of cannabis and to develop, uh, to develop safe and effective treatments. Thank you very much for your attention. That's the end of my presentation. Mm -hmm.